for this video presentation, I'm creating this for general information as an overview to build a small step-by-step -step demo. I do not have a small step-by-step -step demo. I have an entire complete central office. I have built small demos and I have custom built many, many circuits that would be equivalent to a demo, but I do not have one to show. And there are many people who have built these uh, systems for demos. So I will just show the basic components required. This is not a training video. I'm not a person uh, that would be good for training. I'm not an instructor. I can just tell you kind of how some of the stuff works. I can make it work, but I'm not that great at explaining how it works. So this is again an informational only for those who may choose to try to build a step switch on their own. You will hear from many, many people how easy it is, how simple it is, and that is a true statement once you understand how it all works. Like anything else, you're not gonna take a person who's never seen a jet engine and expect them to rebuild one uh, and not have problems the first time. That's unrealistic. Uh, the step systems uh, are the simplest of the switching systems. Uh, but yet they can become incredibly complex. And I have a 600 line office with 500 step switches in it and uh, 17 bays of trunks, miscellaneous and so forth equipment. So there's many videos I have on my channel showing the office and some of the details. But again, I don't get down to the nuts and bolts of what wire does what. Uh, on every switch. It would take too many weeks to make a video like that and I'm not the person for that task. So in a step office, regard it, regardless if it's a Western Electric, ITT, Stromberg Carlson, or Automatic Electric, the fundamentals will be the same. The way the work is accomplished, it will be different, such as the XY, but the, electric, the XY is electrically um, compatible with the Western and AE and ITT step with a couple of variations. And I will not get into that because that's far past the scope of this video. So quickly, every telephone line, regardless of who made it, will have a line relay and a cutoff relay. They will look different depending on whose equipment. For an example, this is a Western Electric line and cutoff. Automatic Electric had relays that were the 200 series style, as well as they had the peanut relay. ITT Federal had these similar types of relays. And uh, Northern Electric, which was Bell of Canada, of course, was partially owned by AT&T, so the parts were interchangeable with Western Electric, so they would look the same. And they are technically the same, other than the stamping. One says NE, the other one says WE. So you'll have a line and a cutoff. In this particular line group, I have 200 lines. If you were building a demo, you would most likely only have one strip of line and cutoff relays of some kind. And those are, are quite difficult to actually come by. You can substitute different relays to provide those functions. Um, and without getting into the nuts and bolts of relay design and all that stuff, uh, it can be simply done. One of the things that the line and cutoff relays do is there's not shown, but they look identical, what's called group relays. Because I have 200 lines, as far as the wire bank under the line finder is concerned, you have an upper and a lower bank. So the lower bank is the lower 100 lines, the middle bank is the upper 100 lines, and then the top bank is your sleeve and sleeve one. <clears throat> if you have more than 10 
lines, then you would use more than one level on the bank. So for simplicity, I'm going to assume you're building a 10 line or less system. And it doesn't matter how many lines it is, it's once you've figured out how to make it 10, the next one for 20, 30, 40, whatever, is, is the same thing over and over with one additional relay for every 10 lines. So <clears throat> when the line relay operates, you operate a group relay. The group relay um, provides a ground on the bank, on the commentator, and I'll show that momentarily, and it starts the line finder. This can be achieved uh, with probably diodes. I haven't tried it, but I'm assuming two diodes would perform the function you need. Once the line is found <clears throat> and the selector is connected through, you would operate the cutoff relay, which opens up the line relay because the line was found. So the cutoff relay will be operated for the duration of the call. Then, um, the line finder, of course, will step up to whatever level you chose to use, and then it will rotate in for terminals one, two, three, up to zero. That is a simple concept, but to wire all that to work is a little more detailed. One thing I caution to people about trying to wire this stuff up, if you are intimidated by a four pair of Cat5 cable and you feel it's overwhelming, do not attempt to do anything in this video because you are going to be grossly overwhelmed. If four pairs of wire does not scare you, then you can continue on watching this video. Here is the wiring to the mainframe. That was all wire that I hand wired which is identical to the way Western did it, with the exception that I had modern central office cable and not the old central office cable. I will show the commutator, and I will quickly operate the line finder just to give you an idea what it sounds like. That steps it up to the top position. And when it reached it, it cut in. I got a problem apparently on that line finder and the wiper, so I would need to adjust that. And that brings up a good point. I'm glad that I have that. Down here in the bank, which I would try to um, go down. Sorry about the uh, movement on the camera here. Down here in the bank, the tip and ring wipers must land on the terminals directly in the center of each of the terminals. Occasionally a wiper will be um, misaligned, especially when they've been taken off the bank and put back on. So whenever you're working on a line finder, if it's not set up for that specific position and that, you may need to do a minor adjustment. There's a commutator down here, and this is what uh, through some more circuitry tells the line finder where the level is that it stops. And that commentator is grounded off the group relay that I just spoke about. Once the line finder has found the line and cut in, you have dial tone from the first selector. So for a basic demo, if you want to do this all of the way, you need some line and cutoff relays, at least two to where you can call between two phones up to however many you want it to be and then a uh, control relay or some diodes a piece of line finder bank which is about as easy to find as hundred dollar bills laying on the ground a line finder and in the case of western electric the ones i'm using are 33013 or 33014 but there's PBX versions, ITT had their own, automatic electric line finders are 100% useless because they require extensive control circuits to make them work. So if you're looking for a line finder on eBay and it says automatic electric, keep on looking. Western Electric and ITT are the only ones that made self-stepping switches that are self-contained. 
with that being said, um, the bank in this case has 600 wires on it and you need the tip ring and sleeve and sleeve one and uh, that's not necessarily true. It's tip ring and sleeve and then the line relay provides a uh, battery to the sleeve lead for the line finder to stop on that line. And again, I don't want to get into those details. I'll show the selector switch next. So again, you need a line circuit, line finder, a first selector, and a connector. You'd also need to have a tone source and a ringing source. And uh, of course, a 48 volt power supply as well. I did have a lower wiper that was catching on the bank, so I now have it fixed. I had the camera looking at a selector switch. This particular selector switch in my office here is a special function switch. This one does have dial tone on it. And if you wish to dial the CNET number of 377-0505, you would actually land on this switch. And then you could dial through my office. So that, that is a first selector. And it is, in, in my case, not connected to a line finder. However, in a normal case, that would be directly wired to the line finder, which I showed great, uh, a few moments ago. This uh, particular switch is a 30976. It's a semi-complicated switch. Uh, my office is made up of mostly these types of switches. Uh, with automatic electric, they have different numbers, of course, ITT, different numbers, and then if it was a Stromberg XY, it would look radically different, but we're not gonna get into that. So this switch is where dial tone would originate from and the however many digits it was set up for. You can use it as a one digit only switch or you can use it as a multi digit switch depending on how the digit absorbing is set up. In this case, I am not digit absorbing on that particular switch. So it's only going to be a single digit switch. This is a complex switch doing an incredibly simple job in my application, but I have lots of them and I didn't want to downgrade it to a 30200, which can only handle one digit. So connected to this switch on the rear of the shelf is a dial tone coil, which one side of the dial tone coil is connected to the tone supply. And then the other side is connected in series with a PS relay, which is not needed. In this case, they did that to show off hook and the PS stands for permanent signal. So when you go off hook and seize the switch, you would definitely um, have the PS light lighting up. My office has touch tone converters. So the touch tone converter in the case of my switch is wired between the line finder and the first selector. If you're not using touchstone, doesn't matter. Um, and touchstone converters are pretty difficult to come by. Uh, they did make them for single uh, switches and then uh, card cages for 20 or 30 or 40, depending on who made it. So you had Telltone and Mitel were the two big tone to pulse converters. I will quickly call this number on CNAP. So I dialed the digit three, it stepped up to the third level and it landed on the first terminal. If this was a digit absorbing switch, depending on if you had the off normal program strip here for the off normal contacts, I could have digit absorbed or I could play other games with it. Too complex for this video. So this gives you an idea. The one thing about selector switches, the more of them you have, 
wired in a chain, that means the longer the phone number can be. In my office, I have first selectors and then what's technically called seconds, thirds, fourths, and fifths. There's a reason for that. I have an incredibly complex dialing system with multiple office codes and all kinds of other neat little games going on. Um, so you can make your phone number as long as you want by adding more switches or digit absorbing. For a basic collector, if you have the line finder, selector, and connector, you have a one talking path, three digit system. I'm looking at a connector switch at this point. This is where the last two digits of the telephone number is dialed. In this particular case, it's a four wire switch. I have a tip ring sleeve and control lead or A lead, depending on what uh, this switch is set up for. They're a larger switch, they have a lot more relays, and this is becoming far more complex of a switch to work on. In addition to the line and cutoff, line finder, selector, and connector, every switch will have a need for an interrupter. This is a large interrupter for an actual real size step-by-step -step office. This office has a multi-party ringing, code ringing, and some other leads that would not normally be needed in a demo. You just need to have the 120 IPM for unused levels, the 60 IPM for a busy line, and then the one ring for a ringing uh, lead to the connector shelf. The ringing is very complex on how that is actually done, far past the scope of this video. And depending on the connector switch, the interrupter uh, will all determine how that would need to be wired. Uh, most demos do not need to have complex ringing to them. There's ways of getting around the complexities on some of the connectors uh, and a scaled down interrupter. In addition to the interrupter, below that here is a tone generator. There's nothing to see. It is just a rectangular cube with a few terminals on it. It's a transformer, some solid state components, and that's it. There's nothing to show. Below it, and I'll show that in a moment, is the ringing generator. Now this is a big honking ringing generator for an actual full-size central office. Absolutely gross overkill for anything a demo would ever need. And Telabs made nice ringing generators that you can do superimposed ringing with. And those are relatively in inexpensive on eBay. And sometimes you may find solid state interrupters on eBay that can be gotten again relatively cheap as well as there's people out there who've made their own if you wanted to have a dial 9 trunk or a dial 0 to connect to a switchboard this is a very simple trunk it's a two circuit trunk unit it's uh, called a dial to dial um, with battery and ground pulsing, which means these have to be modified before you can use them on a phone line. These are fairly common and they're not too terribly expensive. This one is a 31773 outgoing trunk. And this would be wired to one of the vacant levels of your first selector shelf or anywhere that you wanted to have the trunk on a um, dial basis. This is one of the shelf alarms you got a ps relay that i spoke about it earlier and a release relay you only need one ps and one release for your demo and the ps relay is really not necessary either the release relay is not a hundred percent necessary either however i would always recommend having it because it would give you an alarm indication uh, that you've got a hung up switch. I'm just showing this for reference, but these are 70 type fuses. 
and below it, what looks like light bulbs, those are what's called resistance lamps or ballast lamps. They're used to protect the power supply from a direct short. This is two aisles out of five of the Western Step Office. Quick view of the training manual for uh, Western Electric Step Office. This has been scanned and uploaded to the Telephone Collectors International uh, site by somebody, not me. This is a good training manual on how the circuit diagrams are drawn and um, it tells you how they work and it's fairly elementary unlike the drawings for the regular step switch that can become very complex. I'll just show you a quick training schematic for a 30200 selector. I will make a quick uh, detailed video of the symbols and what they're talking about. I won't go into great detail on it because again this video is not for that type of detail. This drawing is what's classified as a highway drawing. It shows how the current flow or the circuit flow is. There's also another kind of a drawing that becomes incredibly complex for anybody new to this and they're called detached contact schematics. I will show one, but uh, they are way complex for, for the beginners. So in this case, they're showing the release magnet here and this little zigzag here on the bottom that uh, I'm gonna try to get closer to here. Sorry about the shakiness of the camera right here. That tells you that this has got a non-inductive winding, which is a resistor. Um, the next thing they're showing over here is the B relay and it has a letters inside of it called SR. That is a slow release relay. That's a very important on the step switch. Over here we have just a contact that you plug in a butt set or a busy to and you got ground. Once you short that together it grounds the sleeve lead. Um, then you have, of course, the D relay and others. And here at the top of this is the 11th rotary. So when you go to the bank, let's say you dial a five and you go to the fifth level. And if all 10 levels was busy, you would operate this and that stops the switch from stepping. So they uh, refer to that as the 11th spring. It also provides tone, a busy tone to the calling person. I'm zoomed in on the A relay. That's the battery feed relay. There's two windings on it and they're wired power in opposing directions so it doesn't chatter and, and so forth when you go off hook. Uh, in this particular case, they show the where the um, bottom of the coil is I believe and then up here shows the contacts which is what um, when the A relay is operated um, it then uh, closes the contact I'm sorry it opens yeah it closes the contacts to your selector switch uh, anyway these are fairly simple and there is elsewhere in the book charts that tell you what this does um, as in how it operates in more detail they're not showing you everything that switch can do because it's simply a training manual automatic electric which i will show one momentarily made step-by-step -step training manuals that is far easier to understand because they kind of gave you the big picture not just a piece by piece basis and in step-by-step -step and a crossbar and other systems as well generally they give you an item by item schematic a line finder only the control relay only or group relay uh, a selector switch or a connector switch so you have to have a bunch of schematics and know how to piece them together in order to get the big picture the automatic electric training manuals kind of have a simplified overview the training manual for a 33013 line finder. 
between the line finder and the connector, those are the two most complex switches. And then you have the ringing and interrupter on top of it. This kind of shows you just how fast this becomes more and more involved. This is a quick drawing for the 31779 two-way trunk circuit. There's only four relays on it and it shows the circuit flow and how it works. You have to modify these in order to make outgoing trunks by removing the battery in the ground off of the pulsing relay, which uh, is the D relay. And then you got your B, the slow release, and your C relay, that's another control relay. This is pretty simple, and building outgoing trunks is relatively simple. I'll include a quick video showing a very complex payphone trunk for a step-by-step -step office. Do not attempt to work on these until you've got years of experience. These are very complex, and there is lots of things going on and lots of other equipment required to make them work. Here is a very complex schematic this is for something that you will probably never in your lifetime ever see or have the opportunity to work on. This is one of two pages for a switchboard sender, and I do have a video up on a switchboard sender, and I will be making one in the future showing the complexities of the operator trunks and what was happening and what was needed to uh, complete calls. Again, this particular segment's only for showing you the complexity of the relays. This is a highway drawing, and the page is approximately 40 inches left to right and about 30 inches tall. And this does not show any of the terminals for uh, connecting it up. Those are on other pages. Uh, this is something that will person will encounter. Here's a bunch of resistors and other components, and they got all of these numbers and letters in circles. Well, those are the options. Those really suck when you get a piece of equipment and you have to figure out what option you have in that equipment. Beginners generally would not ever have to deal with anything like this at all. Rear of a refurbished Western Electric selector the wiring of it. Rear of the complex coin trunks. This is just to show you how complex the wiring can be. This is a modified drawing of a highway schematic. This has been redrawn to be what's called a um, detached schematic drawing. This shows you how radically different the um, drawings, the types of drawings. I showed you the switchboard sender that had a lot of blue lines that was very large sheets. Well, this is the um, redrawn version. Of course, there's multiple pages of this, but this just shows you how they can condense it down and in some aspects make it easier to follow your way through the circuit. The number three crossbar, like the number five crossbar it has a marker in it but in this case this is a combination marker it can uh, do dial tone connections and uh, completing the call I'm showing this just to show how complex they can be the schematic for just the marker the relays that we're showing is over a hundred pages long and it's a detached schematic drawing like the one I just showed previously this is one of the best books to try to read, and I believe this has been uploaded to the Telephone Collectors International website. I certainly hope so. This is a great book for learning how the step stuff works. I wished I would have had this 30 years ago, or actually almost 40. I hope this video provides a little bit of insight and help. Please like and subscribe Thank you.